Hannah Tailford's body, naked except for stockings and underclothes stuffed into her mouth, was found in the river. In April, the river cast up at Chiswick the nude, tattooed body of Irene Lockwood. She had not been dead for very long. The same month, a mile from the river, another tattooed prostitute, Helen Bartlemy, was found in Brentford. Acton again, July. Mary Fleming's body was dumped in a cul-de-sac. In the night, neighbours heard a car stop, reverse and roar away in panic. Four months later, victim number five. The tattooed body of Frances Brown, a witness at the Stephen Ward trial, was found in a car park. For six girls, such curbside encounters have ended in death. The killer is still at large. In the 1960s, a killer would terrify the London suburbs, preying on young girls who had turned to prostitution to help them survive in the big city. At least six, but probably eight, women lost their lives to the cruel and sadistic killer who seemed to be roaming the streets of London. It wasn't long before the killer, whoever it was, became known as Jack the Stripper because of the location and the fact the victims were prostitutes and how the killer left the bodies partially or fully naked. It would become one of Britain's biggest manhunts ever and just like the killer's namesake, they would never be found it would remain the largest unsolved murder case in Britain. In the 1960s, the areas the bodies were found were mostly industrial parts of London. The Thames Riverside hosted many forms of factories and the population consisted mostly of working class families. The people of these streets would live in fear in the 60s as the police struggled to find this unknown killer. Before the first recognised victim, 30-year-old Hannah Telford's body was found, there were two other women found that could have been killed by the same person. They were young, slim prostitutes, killed and left in a similar way. It seemed to fit the other victims' profiles the murders could possibly be linked. On June the 17th, 1959, while on a routine patrol of Duke's Meadows, a park in Chiswick, close to the Thames, they came across a woman's body. She was naked from the waist down, her dress torn and ripped open, revealing her breasts. A pathologist concluded that her death had occurred between midnight and 2 a.m. on the day she was found. Marks around her neck were consistent with strangulation. Her underwear, handbag and shoes were missing and no other personal items were found. They needed a positive ID, so they placed a post-mortem picture of her in the local paper and she was recognised by her mother and her roommate. Her name was 21-year-old Elizabeth Fig, a known prostitute she had last been seen getting into a car with a client. The police determined, after a fruitless search, that Miss Fig's handbag and other missing items had possibly been left in the client's car but without a description of either the car or the driver, the case went cold. Another possible victim was a young Welsh girl who had relocated to London, 22-year-old prostitute Gwyneth Rees. On 8th of November 1963, her body was found dumped on a refuse disposal site, approximately 40 yards away from the Thames and the park that Miss Fig had been found. Horrifyingly, her head had been decapitated by one of the workers who was levelling the dumped rubbish with a shovel. Her front teeth were also missing. She was found naked with only a single rolled down stocking on her right leg. Why were they never connected to the other victims? Apart from the dumping site and Miss Fig not being mutilated, 
most everything else seems to fit. The first official death attributed to the killer was that of 30-year-old mother of two, Hannah Telford. Hannah had been missing for about a week. She was pregnant at the time of her death. She was found on the shore under the London Corinthian Sailing Clubhouse on February the 2nd, 1964. Her front teeth were missing and her underwear had been shoved into her mouth. She had also been strangled. They eventually worked out that her body had gone into the water at around Duke's Meadows Park. The police let her down badly at the start. Although they interviewed many people who had known Anna in one way or another, nothing came of the interviews and the attention to her death died down. It was shockingly almost considered she'd taken her own life. But things were about to change when, nine weeks later, on April the 8th, 1964, another woman's body was found on the foreshore of the Thames River. Another petite young woman, 25-year-old Irene Lockwood, a young woman from Nottinghamshire, was found apparently strangled and naked. It was also discovered she was pregnant at the time. Now the police couldn't deny what was happening and had to link the death of Hannah Telford with this recent murder. A pattern had emerged. All the girls were prostitutes, yes, but they were all also similar in stature. They also linked the death of Gwyneth Reese, but, and it's not known why, Reese wasn't on the official victims list. The newspapers were all over this story. The police couldn't deny they had a serial killer in their midst. The media now naming the killer Jack the Stripper. Jack was quick and within weeks he had struck again. This time the victim, 22 year old Helen Bartholomew was found strangled in an alleyway on the 24th of April 1964. This case would give the police their first piece of solid evidence. Specks of paint were found on her body, the sort used in car spray painting. The police became convinced that the killer worked in car manufacturing and maybe they were close by in one of the local businesses. Her front teeth were also missing. On a couple of occasions, the police were told by people living close by that they had heard a car late at night close to where the body was found. The police presence was now heavy in that area. They put policewomen dressed as prostitutes to try and lure the killer out. Unfortunately, it didn't work and the killer was relentless. On the 14th of July, 1964, 30-year-old mother of four, Mary Fleming's body, was found on Berrymead Close in Chiswick. Mary had turned to prostitution when her marriage had broken down and she needed to supplement her income to feed the children. Once again, paint spots were found on her. Her front teeth were also missing. She had been strangled and she was naked. And once again, a car was heard reversing at speed away from the scene. The police were now hoping the killer would make a mistake. They'd be disappointed. 21-year-old Margaret McGowan, who used the alias Francis Brown, was discovered on the 23rd of October 1964 in a car park on Horton Street, Kensington. This murder was only different in the fact that she was a more upper-class prostitute who worked in a more affluent area of London. She'd also been strangled, her teeth were missing and she was also naked. She was last seen by a friend getting into a client's car in October. This friend was able to give a description of the car and the driver. 
McGowan had been a witness for the defence in the trial of Stephen Ward, one of the political figures involved in the Profumo affair, a high-profile British political scandal at the time that also involved Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis. A connection was considered that some of the women had attended underground parties and it gave the police some hope. The description given by Brown's friend, fellow prostitute Kim Taylor, was huge. Could this be the break they needed? Unfortunately, even with the identity kit picture, it wasn't enough. The year was now 1965. And on January the 11th, 27-year-old Bridget O'Hara was reported as missing. Her body would be found on February the 16th, 1965, near a store shed on the Heron Trading Industrial Site, Acton. Industrial paint flecks were found on the body and it was concluded that her body was part mummified. Her body must have been stored for some time in a warm place before being dumped. Johnny De Rose, or Five Day Johnny, named because of his ability to close a case quickly, was put on the case as chief detective. He mobilised a huge investigation that consisted of investigating and interviewing all 7,000 workers on the industrial estate. Plain clothes police were put in place to record all license plates coming in and out of central London at night, making sure a note was made if license plates showed up on multiple occasions. De Rose delved deeply into finding where the paint originated from that had been found on four of the victims. And after an extensive search that covered 24 square miles, they found a match under a nearby transformer, just a few feet away from where Bridie Bridget O'Hara had been found. Opposite was a spray paint shop, where a match to the paint found on the victims was found. They now believed the transformer was where the killer had stored the bodies. An excited John DeRose informed the press they were close to catching the killer. Then he made a statement that they had narrowed the suspect list down to 20, then just to three. He hadn't, it was a false statement, but the killings apparently just stopped. An arrest was never made from that day to this. The women that were so viciously murdered and their families that were left without their mother, sister, daughter, would never see the monster who did this brought to justice. But there were suspects. The main suspect was apparently a middle-aged Scotsman who worked as a security guard at the industrial estate. His name was Mungo Island. He did have access to the lockup where they believed the bodies were kept. The police were sure it was him. They kept a close watch on Island and he knew he was being watched. He became more convinced he was going to be arrested when De Rose mentioned in an interview, without naming anyone, that the killer was a married man with children, and he, De Rose, knew who the killer was. Island, in a depressed state, left a note for his wife. It read, I can't stick it any longer. It may be my fault, but not all of it. I'm so sorry Harry is a burden to you. Give my love to the kid. Farewell, Jock. P.S. To save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage. After Ireland had died, their case was shelved. De Rose was said to mention that the killer had now taken his own life. It wasn't until a book about the murders came out, one written by David Seabrook, that the name of the suspect was revealed. The book also claimed that Ireland had only been working at the Heron Trading Estate for three weeks. 
Seabrook suggested that De Rose, not wanting his reputation sullied, pin the murders on a dead man. It would also come out in 1972 by journalist Owen Summers that Ireland was in Scotland at the time O'Hara was killed, so he couldn't have killed her. And she was one of the victims of the stripper killer, so maybe he wasn't involved. But then why would De Rose risk his reputation telling people there would be no more murders if he wasn't a hundred percent certain. And he was right, there wasn't. But there were other suspects. Freddie Mills, a champion boxer. In fact, he was the light heavyweight champion of the world in 1948. He was also friendly with many of the London underground gangsters. It's rumoured he was in debt to the Cray Twins often being seen at private parties thrown by the craze and others. There are a few rumours around regarding Freddie Mills, so it's difficult to know the truth of this one. It's also believed that some of those gangster friends were sure it was him who committed the murders. His death allegedly had a twist. It's been said he arranged with the Cray twins to have himself killed. Whether that's true or not, he was found in his car in July 1965 with a shotgun in his lap and a bullet in his head. It was ruled that he had taken his own life. This also coincided with the end of the murders. Three weeks after Irene Lockwood was found, Kenneth Archibald walked into a police station and confessed to killing her. But his story didn't seem to fit. There was no evidence and plenty of inconsistencies. At his trial in 1964, he recanted his confession, stating he was drunk when he made it. He was found not guilty and let go. Many years later, a Welsh author investigated and wrote about a disgusting individual called Harold Jones. Jones was a convicted SA and murderer. At the age of 15, he was arrested and acquitted in a sensational trial in 1921 for the killing and awing of a young girl in his hometown of Abertilly in Wales. After his release, he went straight out and committed the same crime again. This time, the young girl was found in his attic with her throat cut. After confessing, the judge at his trial sentenced him to the maximum he could give a person under the age of 16. His story is long and horrendous. But just for context with this case, we need to look at this guy. Jones served his time in Wandsworth Prison, London. In December 1941, at the age of 35, he was released and seemed to vanish. He resurfaced towards the end of the 40s, having changed his name to Harry Stevens, and now living in Fulham, by 1962, he had vanished again. The author, Neil Milkins, who was researching his crimes, found it difficult to trace him from then on, but eventually he found Jones had died in 1971 and was buried in Hammersmith Cemetery, West London. He had apparently decided to stay in London, where he met his wife and had children. It's not altogether wrong to look at this guy. After all, he was a vicious killer living within proximity of the murders. Firstly, he was a convicted killer of young girls. The victims of Jack the Stripper case had that petite young girl look about them. He also stored bodies before disposing of them. He lived very close to where the Hammersmith murders occurred and also lived just a few feet away from the victims Hannah Telford and Bridget Bridie O'Hara. 
Just as compelling is the fact that he apparently worked as a panel beater on the industrial state where the bodies had been stored and where the paint had been traced to. He also worked as a caretaker on the estate. Lastly, the murders stopped around the time Jones discovered he had bone cancer that would eventually kill him in 71. There's no evidence to say Jones was involved at all, nothing. But saying that, Jones is a really good contender. We will probably never know who this killer was and it's unfortunate that this brutal killer has managed to escape justice. Thank you for watching.